Come on in, come on in, take a seat. We got those 3-inch foam pads for you guys for a reason, so you can use them. Come on in. Resurrection Sunday. Jesus, 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 come on. Let's give a shot of praise this morning. No, no, not enough. We're talking about the guy that defeated the grave and kicked the devil in the teeth. Can we give a shot of praise this morning? Sean and I just wanted to say good morning to you this morning and just point out um, that you'll notice that we have a candle in the back corner and a beautiful guitar sitting up front. Our oldest beloved member, Ruben, is with Jesus today. He is celebrating Easter. Um, he left on Monday night. And so there will be a service for him this week. He, Ruben Detman, lived alone, drove himself. Uh, has played on the worship team every single week. I've, he was he went out with Barbara Leroy on Sunday on the phone with his daughter at 9.30 Monday night and just went to bed. 96. So we just celebrate Ruben's life, right? And we just thank you so much, Jesus, that we get the opportunity to come into this moment of worship and to join a throne room that Ruben's dancing in today. One of my favorite stories about Ruben, just in the last couple of months, he said to me, I had my hip replaced a couple years ago. That was no big deal. Now they want to do my knee, and I'm not going to let them because it would slow me down. <laughs> Sign me up, right? Sign me up. So we just wanted to take a moment and acknowledge that Ruben's chair is empty today, and we're just going to hold him in our hearts, hold his family in our hearts as we say goodbye, even though it's a celebration for him. Visitation is Wednesday evening um, in Glenwood City from 4 to 7, and then the service is here on Thursday morning at 11, so please come and join us and celebrate Ruben's life. Yeah, hi, and welcome everybody. So, yeah, Ruben's not with us on earth, not alive, but now he's fully alive. So, pretty interesting on Easter, huh? So, Sean Michael Higgins says Easter's like the Super Bowl for Christians. Yeah. 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 So that must mean that was the game Friday or Saturday, whatever we won. Yeah. <laughs> he won. Yeah. We win because he won. Yeah. He won for us. So uh, we, a couple of us were here watching the Passion of Christ, right, on Good Friday. And um, that's, kind of where, that's kind of where it all started, right? See, every, every single thing that we're about and that we get started on Good Friday with the passion, with the, the whipping, the beating, the wages of sin, all of our sin, left and shredded, like some of the sin in our life has left, left us shredded. But then Sunday came and today came. And because he rose, we can rise. Something that we could never do for ourselves in our own lives and for eternity he did for us. It was accomplished on the cross and proved today. So it's kind of ironic that we, we, we're we really celebrating something that's empty. The tomb is empty. The grave is empty. All the result of our sin and shame, it's gone. It's gone because of today. So stand up, everybody. Give thanks and give praise to the King. One. We won. We won. Oh, hail, King 
Amen. Amen. Jesus.
odd to have it right after on Easter. It's, it's a rare occasion. As I thought about this, I thought, you know, when when Good Friday happened, my first image was the new covenant, the old covenant, smashed together like a train, and the new new covenant wins. Yeah. But Jesus said that's not right. I never came by force. I came to overtake the old covenant and give you something new. A little background on that week that he was the Holy Week. Uh, for the Jewish Passover started on that Wednesday with the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, is what they actually call it. So Wednesday of that week, the household had to get rid of everything that was had yeast in it and everything that was fermented to cleanse the house of, of anything that was leavened. Thursday was the day that they slaughtered the lambs. And that week that is estimated over 200,000 lambs got slaughtered for the Passover feast coming up on Friday. <clears throat> Friday was the day of preparation when they ate the, the Passover lamb before sundown. Now it's interesting to note that what did they eat on the Last Supper? Jesus knew the law. He came to fulfill the law. He couldn't, he could not eat nor his disciples eat the Passover lamb on Thursday night because they would have been in violation of the law and everything would have been null and void. Because they would have had to pick the lamb on Tuesday, slaughter it on Wednesday, and eat it on Thursday, which was against all the Passover religion. But what did Jesus do? He offered himself as a sacrifice. When John, when John the Baptist saw him, it's recorded in the scripture, John 129, you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So on that Thursday night, he didn't offer the Passover lamb, he offered himself. He didn't break tradition, he just renewed tradition. He knew that the old, old law was, was null and void. So it's, that was a kind of a bombshell that God dropped on me. It's like, you realize that Jesus didn't overstep his bounds. He was all in his, his bounds and he offered himself. The disciples still thought, they're going to eat Passover with, with, with Jesus Friday night. <laughs> Little do we know that didn't happen. So we're still serving him. <laughs> it's nice to have a full house. Now the bathroom comes like, I better make some more cups because they might run out. <clears throat> so, I well, always got some time. Jesus came. What was Jesus' main purpose? New covenant. New covenant, new thinking. And that's what he did on, on uh, Good Friday and uh, uh, Good Friday as well, but uh, during the Last Supper as well. So, everybody been served? You can hold up your bread as the victory service today because he is the Lamb of God that takes away sins that are past, present, and future. Amen. He is taking away the penalty of sin. We all know we still mess up, but he's taking away the pen of the son of death, which was, which was death. So, Father, we thank you for Jesus giving his body to us, breaking it in a way that no one else could break it. And we just ask you to bless him with bread. Let's eat together. Uh, Hebrews 10, 4 says this, The blood of bulls and goats cannot cover sin. Do you realize how many animals were sacrificed up until the point of the cross that couldn't do a thing about sin? Jesus, with the new blood, his own blood, was the only one that was able to cover our sins and get rid of the sin issues forever and ever and ever. Amen to that? Amen. The blood in the Old Testament time was meant for the Passover, which was spread on the doorpost of your, of your house so that the death angel could pass over your house. Jesus' new blood washes our soul, and the death angel passes over us again, relieving from us the penalty of sin, which was separation from God. So through the blood, we are free to serve him. So Father, we thank you for this bread. We thank you for this cup. We do ask that uh, as we drink of the cup, that the new blood would course through our veins in a way that has never been seen before, and that we can glorify your name because of it. So let us drink.
acknowledge the, um, the PowerPoint and, and the sound people in the back. Yeah. Nobody thinks about them until something goes wrong. <laughs> right, so we just thank you guys so much for, I know you were sweating back there through the worship service trying to get the words up, but you know what? The Bible doesn't say we have to make a, a perfect sound, the right sound, the right words, just a joyful voice. So thanks for thanks for all of that. We're doing family together, right? We're doing all of family together. So make sure that your kiddos are with you at all times, not wandering the building un unsupervised. Um, I just wanted to share uh, share something that the Holy Spirit has on my heart this morning. Um, so I wanted to share with you guys something that the Holy Spirit has on my heart this morning, that in this resurrection celebration, I just feel a shift in the atmosphere, that something is shifting quickly. Um, and so I just want to speak that over each of us individually and corporately, all of us together, that, that thing that we've been kind of battling against, there's a swift shift, a swift shift, something that we've been like wa walking through dredging through, slogging through. This resurrection day is a celebration for something swiftly shifting. So if that's you, if you feel like you need, I need a something, I need the lights to come on, I need the light switch that, that quickly, that quickly. If that's something that you've been contending for, I would just put your hands out in front of you. I'm receiving it for myself. I feel something quickly shifting personally and corporately. And Jesus, we just thank you for what you've released through the resurrection. We thank you that you have a good and perfect plan even when we don't see <laughs> even when we don't see we celebrate the process and we thank you jesus that you're releasing something quickly shifting in my life i receive that in my life i receive that for my family's life if that's you just say that out loud i receive that for me i receive that for my family and jesus we thank you that you're doing that also with this corporate body and living word we just thank you for the swift shift this morning this resurrection sunday Amen. Swift shift. Amen. 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 Jenny, I think you're next, darling. You guys give Jenny a hand. How much do you love these? Good morning. Good morning. Oh, what a beautiful day to celebrate. Jesus. Oh, well, I have some announcements this morning. So spring cleaning day is April 23rd. I believe that's next Saturday, right? Um, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So if you're able to make it, please come help and clean. Um, I believe there's going to be some food as well for that, some snacks. Um, family meal is coming up next Sunday, April 24th. And it, the theme is brunch theme. So if you've not signed up, I know that Alicia usually has one coming around. Otherwise, it's back on the table. So please sign up if you haven't for that yet. Also, we have some other fun events coming up. Inspirational painting with Jen. Well, that would be me. <laughs> I knew I was going to do that. I told myself not to do that. Um, on May 7th at 10 a.m., you do not have to be good at painting to come. So please come if you are a woman. <laughs> I, I had to throw that in there. It is for women though, but we're, we're doing it also to celebrate the mothers. And so feel free to bring your children. So we'll have little canvases for them. And um, it's gonna be a wonderful time of fellowship. So that sign up sheet is back on the table as well. Um, it looks similar to this, so if you have any questions, see me after. Well, actually, today I do have to leave a little early. If I'm here, catch me. If not, give me a call. Um, I came to Believe Retreat is coming up at the sanctuary again. <laughs> so excited. This is such a beautiful place to have our retreat at the sanctuary in Clear Lake. Um, work all the steps in one weekend like the founders did, May 13th through 15th. And it's for any affliction, not drugs or alcohol. If you're struggling with depression, if you have a family member who's struggling with addiction and you want to take care of yourself, um, please see me after if you have any questions or give me a call if I'm not here. 
All right, I'm super excited about this. Men's breakfast on May 21st. Yay. All right, so men, notice you guys have something now. So, May 21st, 8 a.m., Golden Coral in Maplewood, Minnesota. That sounds pretty fancy. Oh, it's not? Golden Coral. Corral! All right, thank you. Glad I have my uh, pronunciation check over there. Hey, Golden Corral in Maplewood, Minnesota. Oh, I'm glad I don't have to be perfect to do this. All right, so that's all the events going on. Of course, you know, we love the giving of your hearts. Um, and that's what's most important, but feel free to give what you feel you need to give um, in donations as well. We have the baskets up here. We have many other ways to give. I don't see it up today, but it's Venmo, PayPal, text to give. Um, use an envelope. There's envelopes in the windows if you want to keep track for um, your charitable donations. Um, otherwise, I think that's all I have today, and uh, I feel so honored to be able to introduce Pastor Sean today. Wow, that's been, that was fun this morning. I was having a blast, you know, it's like, Oh, uh, when the PowerPoint doesn't work on uh, during the Super Bowl, it's like your quarterback didn't show up, you know? I'm like, ah! But then God's like, dude, just chill. Chill. And I'm like, really? I don't like to chill sometimes, you know? Um, anyway, I want to talk to you guys quick about what's going to go on over the next five weeks here. I'm pretty excited about this. We are going to be going through the book of James. One chapter a week. And I, what's going to happen is that we're going to have you guys read it at home, write down your questions, write down your thoughts, and we're going to have a panel up here. There's going to be four of us up here a week. We're going we're gonna to start an open discussion going through the book of James. Uh, we're going to try that for five weeks and see how that goes. And if we like it, we'll bring it back in the future. If we don't like it, uh, we'll chalk it up as trial and error, some research and development, and we'll move forward. But I'm really excited about it because it's my job up here to try to get as much of the Bible into your head as you possibly can. Who's picked up the Bible and said, uh, what's going on in yeah. here? Who's like, where do I start? What is this all about? Trust me. When someone, when someone new comes to church and says, can I get a Bible? I instantly want to say like, well, hold up. Like, uh, you want me to tell you where you should go? Here's a couple Bible project videos to watch first, because it's not just a, it's not like you pick up the Chronicles of Narnia and you can start in the beginning and get to the end. It is intentionally set up. It's actually a collection of 66 books, uh, separate books written over thousands of years. Uh, it's actually the most powerful book ever written, and when you can grasp it and get it into your heart, it'll it'll revolutionize and change you, but um, it's not like you just can pick it up and, I'm going to start in Genesis. Well, that's fun until you get to Leviticus, then it's not so fun. <laughs> and you're like, what's going on? And you hear a lot of talk of like what Bruce was saying this morning, where some of you out there were like, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Like, you're like, what is that? I've never even heard of Unleavened Bread. So... All that to be said, we want to try to get some of that in you help you to understand it. So you guys cool with that? Yeah. Some of you are. I feel like with the right enunciation during announcements, you can get people to cheer about anything. So if you're like, we just got a shipment of toilet paper from Amazon at our front step. <laughs> yeah. Yes, right to the church out here in the middle of nowhere. All right, so it is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, the day that God played the biggest practical joke on the devil he could. When Jesus went down to the pits of hell, grabbed the keys for good, kicked the devil in the face, and said, see you later. One of my favorite days of the entire year. So... I've been going back and forth with God all week about what I'm going to preach on, what I'm going to teach on, and where I want to go. And some of the things I want to clear up right off the bat is that when Jesus went to the cross, it wasn't 
but he was not forced by God. God did not make him. God was not punishing him. The Father in Heaven wasn't some abusive stepdad who said, I love all my children here so much that I'm going to take it out on my only son. That sounds weird, right? That'd be like if Judah got, uh, did something wrong and we spanked Liam. It doesn't make any sense, you know what I mean? What happened is, is that from the history of the creation of the planet, we were always meant to be in a relationship with God. And what happened was Adam and Eve put us in a place we don't belong. We don't belong here. We don't belong thinking like this. We don't belong feeling separated from God. We don't belong feeling like we're supposed to be perfect. We don't belong feeling like we need to do more to be more. All we've been called to do is be with God. Let Him into our life at wherever we are. You know, I could make a case that maybe Adam wasn't even perfect. Because when God looks at Adam before the fall, he says, oh, it's not good for man to be alone. Why? What was he doing that gave God concern? You know what I mean? That, but Adam didn't know any distance from God. So when, when God comes on the scene and starts to rebuild this relationship, what he does is he says, I want you back. I want you back. All of you, everything, good, bad, ugly, and otherwise. He doesn't say, I need you to be better to get in relationship with me. He doesn't say, I want you back as long as you do this, this, and this, and this. And you say, well, Sean, what about the law? The whole Old Testament is about how to get better. No, the whole Old Testament is to show you that you'll never be able to be good enough for God. You will never be able to be good enough for God. It is absolutely 100% impossible to earn your way into his love, favor, and relationship. You can't do it. Can I get a sigh of relief? Yeah. yeah, like, the, you, to the pressure's gone. The pressure's gone. But when we let sin enter into this world, what sin does is when you screw up, it actually causes you to turn from God. It's, it's what it does. It makes you look at God and say, I've screwed up, I'm not good enough for you, and you walk the other direction. And he's saying, like, no, 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 I know, I know. I know you screwed up. I know that you don't have the capacity to be good enough for me, but I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that because I created you for relationship. I created you for love. And I don't care if you're in the pits of hell or to the highest mountaintop. I'm there with you. I'll walk with you. I want to help you. In fact, if you want to get out of the pits of hell, I'm the answer. I'm the one. I got the power. And we sit there and say, God, we can't do this. We can't do this. And he says, I know. I know. It's okay. So when Jesus comes onto the scene and starts saying, hey, he talks a lot about leaven. You guys are like, what the heck is up with leaven? But leaven is something that gets into the dough. And when heat is applied to it, it rises. It has no choice. It affects the whole batch. You can't unleaven a piece of bread. The only way it's unleavened is if you don't put it in it to begin with. Once leaven hits it, it's over. So Jesus comes on the scene and he starts saying, like, you guys are living in a religious system and a political system, but I've come to show you the kingdom system, the one that my Father in Heaven has presented. It's upside down. It doesn't look like anything you've ever seen before. You say, love your enemy, love your neighbor, hate your enemies. I say, love your enemies, because what joy is in it and what reward is it to just love those who love you? He starts flipping the thing upside down. He starts saying, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be known as the Son of God. They say, blessed are those who are weak, for they will see me. He starts flipping the kingdom upside down and says, hey, the leaven you've been putting in your body lately, that ain't the way it is. The way you read the Bible, it's through the wrong lens. Because when Jesus says, I'm the fulfillment of the law, we get the most freeing and loving individual who's ever entered this planet. When we read the law, we get Pharisees. We get priests and bishops and popes and blah, 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 and all religious law and shame and guilt. And that's what we get when we read the law. So the cross comes up. And what happens is that the biggest and worst political system to ever exist in all of humanity, Rome. You think you have it bad today? 
You think anybody on the planet has it bad today compared to a one world government called Rome who had specialized in the torture and murder of people as a way of controlling the environment around them? It was the worst political system ever. It was the most powerful political system ever. Then you have the Jews. You have the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the temple. You got the worst religious system ever. The worst, the, the worst that has ever been who they think that they're so much better and they're so much greater and you're just a slave and you're just scum and if you can't do it like them, God hates you. Those are the two systems that Jesus is up against. And they brutally sacrifice him on the cross. They exhaust every single ounce of energy they have on breaking the kingdom of God. With the devil in Jesus' ear saying, can one man truly bear the sins of the entire world? With God's power, he could, right? With God's power, he gets on the other side of the cross. When he says, though, is the, the slave is no greater than the master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If the political systems of his time were persecuting him, then the political systems of our time will persecute us. If the religious systems of his time were persecuting him, then the religious systems of our time will persecute us. And you guys are saying, Sean, is this about Joe Biden and Donald Trump? Not even close. Not even close. A political system is when you go with a mob mentality. Or you choose to put truth off to the side to go with something that's like, yeah, I know I shouldn't. Or it's when you control the situation. When you let codependency enter into relationship, you're dealing with a political system inside of you. Religious system. Do more. Be more. Learn more. Do better. Be more. Learn more. Do better. Be more. Learn more. Do better. Right? How many of you make a mistake and you go up one of two things? I gotta cover this up, control it, spin it, get it. That's political. How many of you screw up and you go, um, I just gotta be better. God, I'm such a scumbag. I'm such a worm. Yeah. You know, there's more to the song of Amazing Grace than saved a wretch like me. There's a lot more to it. But that's where we go in the religious spirit. We say, I just need to do more, God. I need to be more. I'll be better for you one day. I'm sorry. And he's sitting up there saying, you don't, you're not getting it. You're not getting it. But the cool thing about it is Bill Johnson says this this week. He said, there's three leavens in us. And when you put heat to leaven in bread, what happens? It rises, right? It rises. So when you get heat in your life, some pressure, whatever leaven is inside of you is going to rise up. It ain't to condemn us, though. It ain't to condemn us. It's for, God, it's, to, it's for God to reveal it. And then once he reveals it, he wants to remove it. And once he removes it, we can go on to the next thing that he's going to reveal because it's an endless thing for the rest of our life. Like, we're never going to be perfect. And if I need to be perfect, then I I'm in the wrong place. I started off my walk with God, single, living in my parents' basement with no job. And when I found God, I was like, this is great, so much freedom, so this is awesome. And I had lived as if he had removed every single thing from my past. And I got to do that for two years because I had no wife, no kids, no job, no bills, no nothing. I just got to go on and learn more about God. Went to school. Well, guess what? When your wife gets in the mix and your kids get in the mix, and you all of a sudden have a job, and there's more responsibility, you start to realize that these systems that you swore were cast away are actually still alive in us each and every day. The more, the more pressure that got put on me, the more I realized, oh my gosh, what am I turning towards? Do I turn towards God in every situation? No. Do I want to? Yes. Two things at odds inside of me. But when the one thing is raised up, I have to realize, like, God, we got to cut this out. How do we cut this out? And that's what we get to. So on the cross on Friday, Jesus is killed, brutally murdered. He's done. He's in the tomb. It's over. And you're the 12 disciples on Saturday. What a miserable day to be alive. The hope of everything. They never got it. The disciples never got what Jesus was doing. It would be the same as if, as if one of the best teachers you've ever listened to on this planet and loved you. It's like... 
you thought they were here to just just to, to change the whole situation. They were going to take down Rome. Everything was going to be better. And the next thing you know, he's dead. He's dead. And the disciples, they had no idea who Jesus was till he rose from the dead. Because if they did, they would have been at the tomb. They would have been at the grave. They would have been waiting because he said he'd raise in three days. They would have been right there saying, okay, good. Here he comes back. Saturday was silent. Surely it was through. You guys know the words. Since when has ever stopped him, right? So what am I getting at in all this? Every time a situation arises in our life, we get to take the kingdom of God. And the price paid on the cross and plant that right in the middle of that situation. Right in the middle of that relationship, right in the middle of that disappointment, right in the riddle, middle of that realization, in the middle of that loss, we get to plant the cross there. That doesn't mean we get to harvest resurrection right in that moment. There's a process. There's a silence on Saturday that we have to walk through. If it was that way, then the gift that we got from God wouldn't mean that much to us. There's a gift in the process. <laughs> There's a gift in the silence on Saturday. How many of you know about kids? They're never your kids, but they got everything. They never had to work hard for it. And then you see kids that worked hard for everything. Who appreciates more? Who appreciates it more? Who appreciates it more? You guys with me? I mean, do it for Listen, here's the deal. I got a joke for I just got to know this. Who's into Jello eggs? Like, let's go. Like, come on. Do you guys like, who likes the Jello eggs on Easter? Nobody? Nobody here. Yeah, come on. Okay, now I got you. Yeah, now I got you guys' attention again. See, my wife doesn't like Jello, and she was like, I'll make some Jello eggs. Can you really trust someone who doesn't like Jell-O? Make one of the best <laughs> Jell-O. You know what I mean? All right, you're back. You're back. Jiggler Jell-O? I think so. We like to, to go back to the political spirit and thinking about the big political. When you start talking about the political spirit, you think about the big political picture. You think about everything that's going on in the government and around the world. It's not. That, that's where our mind goes on a lot of stuff. Because the political spirit's right here. The thinking is right here. So when we come to thinking about Saturday and putting the cross in the middle, we like to think about our actions. But God's not too concerned with our actions in the moment. He's more concerned with the way we think and the way we think about Him. He's more concerned with the way we think and the way that we think about Him. So when we take a cross and put it in the, mo in the moment... For those of you who know the Old Testament, we're taking the blood of the Lamb, we're wiping it over the doorpost. But when we get to the Red Sea, we don't want to cross. When Saturday comes and it's silent and I didn't see the miracle or the change that I wanted right in that moment, do I really want to go through the process of what it's going to take to fully remove that from my life? So I bump myself up against the Red Sea, God parts it, and I don't want to walk through. And I sit on the other side, and I, I sing my worship songs, and I go up for my prophetic words, and I get prayer. But my pastor told me maybe I should call a counselor. Mm, nah. <laughs> See, I'd rather put a band-aid on some of this. We want comfort, and we want to be comfortable. But if I'm popping painkillers with a broken leg, it doesn't change the fact that I have a broken leg. It only makes me comfortable enough to get through that day. Each and every one of us has some sort of thorn inside of us that God wants to remove. But when it comes time to go through the process of it, when we have to sit through a silent Saturday, not knowing when the resurrection is going to come, if it does or doesn't come, but looking back on the price that God paid, do we really want to do it? Do we want to be uncomfortable in that moment? Do we want to push through? Because Jesus said, and he said it in the chosen, and I love it, he said, I ask a lot of those who follow me, but I don't ask very much of those who don't. 
And we like to think it's this big, like, sell everything and go to Africa and help all these people. But it's a lot to do with up here. It is uncomfortable to come up here on Friday and tell you guys about how God took the wrath out on his son. It is uncomfortable to sit in your first counseling appointment and tell that counselor what's going on. It is uncomfortable to push through some of the things that God wants us to do to find the healing in our life that he paid for on the cross. Amen. Woo! Being okay with not being perfect sometimes is uncomfortable. Being okay with making mistakes is uncomfortable because you're battling the religious spirit in that moment. Being okay with standing up for something that you know is right even when you don't want to is uncomfortable. But you're battling the political spirit in that moment. When you put the kingdom of God in the middle of a situation, it doesn't necessarily always mean it's going to be <laughs> euphoric, joyful, and absolutely comfortable. When Jesus was sitting in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was crying and pouring blood out of his head from, from sweating, he was so anguished, he said, God, please remove this cup from me. He didn't want to do it. It was super uncomfortable. But he said, your will, not mine, be done. So as we sit here in, uh, on Resurrection Sunday looking at what Jesus did for us and eventually what happened on, on Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead, we sometimes got to see how that's where we are in the middle of situations in our life right now. We might be sitting in a silent Saturday looking back on the testimony and saying, wow, I know God showed up here in my life. I know I put the blood of the lamb on my doorpost. I know that he took away the sins of the world. I know, I know that he set me free. But I don't feel it. And I don't see it in this situation. And I don't understand it. But I'm going to stand up here and say, the resurrection is on its way. In every single area of your life, the price paid on the cross, there is a resurrection on its way. Because Jesus didn't just come to remove the sins of the world. He came to buy every tiny little infraction in your life to make it whole again yeah. to make it whole again Woo! why would they call the holy spirit the comfort comforter if we weren't going to be uncomfortable why would they call him the comforter if we weren't going to be uncomfortable and i'm looking at some of you and saying you know, you can't help the person next to you on a plane unless you put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Because you're going to pass out. So you say, well, I'm out here doing all this for God. I've said that myself. Well, I'm just helping everybody. And God's like, dude, hey, Sean, we got some stuff to take care of. I don't know, man. I don't know if I like this. I, I don't do this, but you know, I'm, I, I'm sure everybody's guilty of its own, but you know, putting a picture of me baptizing somebody on Facebook is way cooler than going to the counselor. <laughs> I know I should say, I know I should say something at work because the way that they're treating this guy, it's not good. I know I, should, I know I should stand up for something I saw in the break room. I know I should stand up for this kid at school. I know I should say something, but, uh, you know, I'm going to be Switzerland. Who's heard that before? <laughs> be Switzerland. Jesus didn't call us to be Switzerland. He called us to disciple Switzerland. Disciple nations, you get it? Some of you guys have never heard of that before. I had cheesy jokes this morning. They called Jesus the rock because someone was taken for granted. <laughs> cheesy. 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 These are the kind of jokes that maybe, like, my family doesn't talk to me when I get home if I want to make jokes like that. I get joke shamed. I'm determined with you guys. And with myself, to push through 
the Red Sea, to not avoid the wilderness. We act like we're supposed to avoid the wilderness because the Israelites screwed up and that's how they got there. But if we were supposed to avoid the wilderness, why did Jesus spend 40 days there? Why did Jesus spend 40 days in the wilderness? And I want to knock down this perception in Christianity that it's all about euphoric and ecstatic and I feel really good now and everything's really good and I, I got my one day in the church and now I'm pumped up. No, we're called to pay a price because Jesus paid a price. He said the parables of the talents. I gave you something. Give it to the world. And there's some stuff I got to get you out of first before you're going to be able to because he'll never, ever give us something we can't handle. Stephen Furtick talked about this the other day with his wife, but I like to put it into this text. When the, when, the, when the guy found the treasure in the field in the parable Jesus told, did he buy the treasure or the field? He bought the field. He bought everything that went with it. He had to dig it up. He had to move the dirt. He didn't just get the treasure. He got all the work with the treasure. He got all the buckthorn with the treasure. Who knows what it was under? Who knows how much it was, how hard it was to get out? He got the whole meal deal. And that's what God wants with us. He doesn't just want the best parts of us. He wants the worst parts of us. He doesn't care if he's with you in the middle of a victory or in the middle of a defeat. All he cares about is that he's with you. All he cares about is that he's with you. God was with the disciples on Saturday. They just didn't know it because they weren't paying attention to it. They didn't see it. So when Jesus showed up by walking through the wall because they had the door locked because they were driven by fear of the political system of their time, when he showed up, they barely even recognized him right away because they're not looking for it. So if you're sitting in a silent Saturday, if you're on the other side if you're in the middle of something you know Jesus did for you and something you know is coming, start looking for it. Start looking for it. So you're looking for it. Because he's there. And even though I'm not going to avoid the wilderness, I don't want to take 40 unnecessary laps because I didn't get the lesson the first time. Steve Backlund says it the best. Lord, I've seen this bush a thousand times. I've taken 40 laps around it. I don't want to see it anymore. Well, then maybe we need to pay attention. Maybe when Saturday's silent, we don't fill it with our own talking and crying out and grasping at straws and looking for this and looking for that. And we listen to what God is actually saying. Maybe that's why it was silent in the first place. Because he was trying to get their attention. Who knows what would have happened if Peter had grasped and said, wait, let's go to the tomb. Because God's about to tell a stone to roll. Because God's about to tell a stone to roll. And we're going to watch our dear teacher and beloved Lord walk out. Because guess that you had one in a lifetime chance to see that and nobody was there. Nobody saw it. Thankful for us. God will give us another situation to try it again. We're going to end up walking around the same bush in our life until we finally pull it out by the road. Until we finally grab that thing, lift it out, and throw it in the fire. So why don't you place that thing in front of you next time? And say, I'm going to stand at the tomb. And I'm going to wait for the stone to roll on this. Because I know God's coming. And if I have to sit there for months and years, if I have to push on it a little bit myself, Lord, I have planted a cross in this relationship. I have planted a cross in this financial situation. I have planted a cross in this sin in my life. I have planted a cross in my issue. And now I wait. Lord, lead me. Because resurrection is right around the corner. Thank you, guys. Enjoy your Easter.
Oh my God. goodness. God, we are committed to looking for the resurrection even in the silent Saturday. Yeah. Committed to looking for that even when it feels silent. Amen? Amen. 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 Um, ministry team, if you would go ahead and stand up. I want to introduce you to a couple of people. Chris and Rebecca Lyman. Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah. Dale and Sue, come on down. Dale and Sue. Yeah. Alicia Skinner, where is Bruce? Is he? Oh, there he is. He came with the packet. Bruce and Alicia. Am I missing anybody? Kristen, there she is. Kristen. These people are awesome. These people are incredible. They pray for you. They pray for us, which is... You can thank them for that. <laughs> they pray for Sean and Libby. Um, so if you guys need ministry for anything, you need prayer for anything, this team is happy to serve you, to pray with you, to partner with you, to war with you for that resurrection if you feel like you're in a silent Saturday. If you need prayer for absolutely anything, we would love to join you with that. Um, otherwise, go and have a blessed Easter. Happy, happy day. Happy times with your family. May you carry the resurrection of the cross into the moments that you go into today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.